Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining my session on diving deeper into PowerShell uh, with Microsoft Graph API. First of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Chocolatey, Centino, ScriptRunner, and of course, Patch My PC. And without their uh, sponsoring, we wouldn't be here. So thanks a lot. And uh, <laughs> then the obligatory, who am I? My name's Robert. I work in Holland as principal consultant and developer at Vortel. And uh, yeah, that's just about it. Um, unlike my previous session about the introduction to Graph, this is not going to be a, a very slide heavy presentation. It's going to be more demos. So the agenda for today, it's going to be certificate based authentication. Um, I spoke in uh, some small detail about this on my Monday session. And if you follow Ben Reader's session, uh, you should know why it's very important to use that. So I'm going to show you how to do that and uh, how to actually get it working for you. And secondly, we're going to try and get some uh, reports which don't work in the uh, normal way. Uh, see how we do with that. We're going to have a little discussion about paging and throt uh, throttling. And last but not least, I'll show a bit of batching. I was going to do something about pester test, but I couldn't get it to work in time for the demo. So I'll see if I can slide it in the code later on. But unfortunately, I won't be presenting that bit today. No. Ah, there we go. That's uh, basically all the slide work for today. <laughs> so let's go into VS Code. Now, I'll check it once. Can everybody see from the back? Is it clear enough? A little bit bigger? Yeah? I hope it works out with the uh, how I can show the code. but. Let's see. We're going to first check certificate based authentication. Now, in my presentation on Monday, Zoom. Yet? Yeah, nope. Not yet. I'm first going to tell something. I'll Zoom when it's needed. Um, on Monday, I told you about how to create an app registration which is needed to automate things. And uh, I showed you how to create an app reg uh, registration based on a secret. Now, the more secure way, which Ben also told you, is using a certificate. Now, if you go to your regular, wait, Zoom is not even start it, Zoom it. If you go to your Azure AD portal, on the left-hand side, you'll have app registrations. And I will go to the app registration created on the same branch as before, or the same blade as before, under Certificates and Secrets. You can now have a secret, but you can also go to the Certificates tab. Here, you can simply provide a certificate of your choosing, either through Key Vault or your own PKI system, and you need the CER file, and you simply upload it to your app registration. It doesn't get any easier than that. The hard part isn't this. The app registration is created the exact same way. The permissions are set the exact same way. You just provide a certificate instead of a secret. The harder part is getting the code to work, getting your token through or uh, through a certificate. Now, I'll go to the code. I'll first, I have this uh, um, function loaded, and I'll go into that de depth just now to show what it does, and I'll also uh, show you how common modules like the uh, MG Graph module or something like Mini Graph 
deals with certificates. I'll first show, uh, show you this one. Basically, you load the client and tenant ID as before, and the scope as before, and you have a few options to get uh, the certificate token. Either you immediately get the certificate file, so as it's on your local system, or you've installed the certificate either under the local machine or current user store. For the function I'm using, you can use all three methods. However, if you're using one of the modules, the results may vary. I'm going to show you that just now. So in this case, what I'll do is I have the certificate in my folder. And for this example, I'm just going to not use the installed version. And what I'll do is I'll get a token. That seems fine. I'll show you what the token looks like. And I'll zoom in in a second. Um, now, oh, so we see the app display name as per the app provided. And if we go down, we see the roles that my app currently has. So it's a valid token. Everything works just fine. I'll show you the code that does it. Now. This function, a colleague of mine made, so I want to give credits to him. Oh, I should get the code. As we say in Dutch, beter goed gejat dan slecht bedacht. He worked it out, and I'm not going to remake it, but I want to give credits to him. His name is Maurice. I also included the documentation on how it works in theory. Now, basically what it does is you provided a certificate. Like I said, you can actually have the file or it's installed in your local store or your uh, current user's store or local machine store. And you provide the default information of client ID, tenant ID, scopes. And it will create the um, JSON web token uh, attestation. And what it basically means is going back to this, uh, the jwt.ms page where you can decode your token, it basically will create all the required claims for your token. So you're basically building a token based on your certificate. So it creates everything, submits it, and you get an encoded token back from Graph. You can read on the entire theory, but basically, You'll need a function like this or a module that provides a function like this. It, it doesn't get any easier than that. I'll provide this function within my uh, uh, script share. So I have a token now. Let's see if I can get it working. I'll just get the users, construct my headers, and let's see if I can get a user. Oh, apparently Yap is still around. Everything works. The only difference is now I'm using a certificate. Like I said, it it's not hard to set up. It's not hard to do the query. The query is exactly the same. It the hard part is the function to get the certificate to get a token. Like I said, there's documentation on how to do this. There's modules that can do this for you. But it takes some getting used to. I'll share this bit of code, and I'll show you how other modules or common modules deal with this. Like I said, I have the MG Graph module. Now, the downside to this is MG Graph requires you to have a certificate installed under your current user store. It doesn't allow you to have a file. It doesn't allow you to have it under 
my uh, local uh, uh, local machine, it needs to have it under current user, otherwise it won't work. Once you've done that, it's basically easy as that. I'll quickly, like I said, in this case, I need this bit of code. For me, it's it's just getting the certificate thumbprint of the file I provided and looking in my store where I have it. So in this case, it means I get the certificate as currently installed. And it requires either a thumbprint, a name, or a friendly name, if I'm not mistaken. And you get this. Do note that if you do uh, the import module for Microsoft Graph, it immediately shows you why I tend not to use the module. It loads a lot of dependencies or required other modules, and it takes a long time. I just wanted my functions to do one simple thing. Now I've saved the token. Let's look at the token. Welcome to Microsoft Graph. Now, this is a security thing. It doesn't like you to share the token because, of course, well, other people might see your token. So it loads it in, um, in script variable. So I can use it within the module. I can do queries. So if I try and get users, I get my users. Everything's formatted nicely. I get all the properties I need. It works. I just can't get my tokens. So using the graph module works. It's just a little different, and it, it's, it's up to personal preference, really. Uh, one of the advantages of using the graph module is if you look in the graph documentation, it will show you examples of how to use it within the module. Let me show you uh, the graph reference, and I'll zoom it in a second. Um, so if I want to list users, which I did just now, Under examples, if you click the PowerShell tab, it will say you need this model, a module, this commandlet, it works. So in that sense, it's very handy. But if you followed my session on Monday, you should be able to get this to work with whatever commandlet you want to use. So invoke web request or rest method. Another common module is the mini graph module by Friedrich Weinmann. This one works a little different as well. Now, if you use the Microsoft Graph module, make sure you import it with a prefix, postfix, whatever, because they have conflicting command names. So I'll just do it with a prefix. Let me get a token there. And like I said, they're all based on certificates, the exact same certificate I used before. Works just fine. Similarly, I get no token. So if you want to use this, fine. You don't, once it starts working, you don't need to see the token. I just use it personally to check if my token has the right scopes, permissions, etc. And using the exact same certificate, I can then query graph again. Not too hard. Get the same results as expected. As you can see, using the mini graph module gives you a different layout. It looks more like the invoke web request or rest method, while the uh, 
MG graph module gives you pretty layout uh, specifically formatted. It's up to your personal preference. Um, so that shows you how easy it is to get certificate-based authentication. And there's really no excuse. If you start working with this in production level, there's no excuse not to start using certificates. Um, you can have them. It, it's like the secrets. The only downside is you need to renew the certificates when they're up for renewal. Um, but you can have something like certificates based out of Azure Key Vault and have them auto-renew. Auto you do have to note that they get auto-renewed in Key Vault. So you still need to sync them to your app registration. So that's something you need to take care of. Or if you get them from a local PKI, you need to make sure that they don't expire. So you need to have a check on, uh, on your app registration if it will expire. If you look on the portal, it's going to be similar to a secret. It's going to nicely notify you when it's going to expire. So you need to build something around that, similar to secrets. Now, we'll go to delayed reports. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by delayed reports. Um, sometimes you'll have something within the graph, which you can't find the actual proper um, documentation for. And I'll show you the example, like within Intune, there's something and I'll zoom in again just now. Under devices, there's a nice export button. Now, in my example, I don't have devices, but I can still run the export. So I'll show you how that works. And how, I how you can figure this out, because I'm going to show you this example. But I'm going to show you how you can see what it's doing in the background. I tried to do this again through Fiddler like I did on Monday. That doesn't seem to work anymore. So I'll show you using dev tools. But that should work just fine. In this way, whatever you try to do in the portal, you can see what it's doing and using the knowledge we uh, are, what I explained to you before, you can reproduce it in code. So what I'm going to do, hope it shows up properly with the zooming. So you open DevTools, you go to the Network tab, and then the important bit is you click this, so Network tab, and click Fetch XHR. Now I'm going to click the Export button. I'll choose whichever one I want. And you can see it doing things. And as you see at the top, it's exporting data, it's waiting, it's waiting. And this would be really weird if you try and do just one call, because it turns out you don't get a result, or you don't get the report if you do this just calling the endpoint. And I'll show you how this works. What it does is it, under the, oh. Under the request URL, it calls the reports export jobs endpoint with a post saying, like, give me your info. However, you get in the second call, you see, wait a minute, I get a different URL. What happens is Microsoft says, I'll, I'll take your request, but I'll queue it. So here's the ID for your request. Come back later and see if we have it finished. And apparently it's taking a very long time because I'm not even getting the save option yet. But what it does is it keeps pulling back and checking. 
Do you have something? Do you have a report for me? I'll show you how that works in code. So, um, first of all, it's going to be a file that we're going to place somewhere. So I'm going to put it in a folder. And for this example, I'm going to have the device export for this customer, but you can redo it for all your customers if you want. So save customer Contoso. Save it in my required file. So I should get something looking like this when I'm done. I'm going to check a different app registration with the correct permissions. And like I said, I'm currently using just invoke web request so I can show you more. Whichever one you prefer doing at the end doesn't matter. Because with the MG graph, there's an invoke MG graph web request commandlet that lets you query whatever endpoint you want. So if there's no built-in module, you can use that one. Just using this one to show you how it goes. Okay, so the endpoint, as we saw at first, is export jobs. Constructing header, constructing all the other required things. It's a post method. I'm going to actively request info. I'm not uh, actively saying create an export job for me, so I'm not just asking data. However, if you look in this first request, is that turns out we had a payload. We provide information on what exactly we want. You can see here's the JSON. Oh, that's a really crappy. <laughs> Sorry. Let me try that one again. Here's the JSON that you provide. So if I'm going to do that, I know exactly what it requires. I can build that in PowerShell. I build a body, convert it to JSON, and add it to my request. So I get this. And this, again, is the difference. Oh, I'll show you. This, again, is the difference between using invoke web request or REST method. I do it so I get the status code and all the extra info. Choose whichever one you like. That means I do have to convert it. And it turns out that I get an ID. And that's basically the job it's being created. And like similarly in the browser, that's where I have to now query. And like I said, you can't find stuff like this in documentation. You just have to do it in the portal and see what happens. So I noticed that the new URI is going to be the old URI. And within brackets or embraces, um, it includes the request ID. Do that. Normally, I'd wait because otherwise it's no use anyway. And I would check to see if I get a report. Now, what I'm looking for is the status as well as the URL, because that's where I can actually get my report. You would normally wait X amount of times and keep trying. So I'll just lower that to five seconds because I don't want to wait that long. But you're basically dependent on how quickly Microsoft will give you information. There we go. Do I have, I have a URL? So download my request, open it. There we go. So now you can automate either 
something that's a delayed request, or actual reports, which is most of the time the same thing. You get it, but now you automate it. You simply use a script, use it for all your customers, you get device inventory. Hopefully that's clear. And if there's any questions, just shout out. And we'll go on to the next bit, paging and throttling. In case people don't know what they are. Yes, question in the back. The question is, when downloading the report, do I have to authenticate it, or is it public? It's public. Yeah. As far as I know, it's you can't get the URL without the active token, and, and because you have to do a, an active request. As far as I see, there's nothing in there that checks for authentication. There's no. Maybe the, no. Is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Apparently it is. Um, and this is just a display bug. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to paging and throttling. Normally, if you request data for the graph API, you'll get limited. So, for instance, if you query users, you get the first 100 users. If you have 50 users, you get the first 50 users, perfect. If you have 101, what happens is you get something called a next link. Um, that means you have more data, but you're going to have to get the data at this point. It's like the Mario thing. I'm sorry, Princess of the, the other castle. Next, 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 until you get what you need. Um, if you have... Uh, or what you can do depending on the query is you can have a max results. So you can say, well, I want to have up to a thousand results. If you have a thousand and one, you'll still get the next link. If you have 999, you'll get them. How does next link work? Now, I can force this by doing a filter on my endpoint saying, I just want the first 10 users. I have 36 users, so I'm forcing paging at the moment. Just getting that thing, and oh, wait. I have the wrong token. Yep, yeah, wait. That should be. Ah, wait, sorry. I have to switch back to the other. The other app registration. I accidentally, I had a specific one for delayed reports, and that could only do delayed reports. So that's where you can, again, limit your apps to doing only the thing you want it to do and nothing else. Unfortunately, for a demo, that's rather annoying. Um, so I need to get a new token. Yep. And now I can do the query again. That's better. Now, I'll show you if I look at the results I get for my first query, I said, give me the first 10, or give me all the users and in blocks of 10. And it says, oh, here's the data, everything's fine. However, you see that there's a next link. It says, there's more to be found there. Now, like I said, it's over here. If I then change it. So let me show you the first user or the first user it finds is conf room Adams. Now I update the property and I go get the next set. Then I get 
Christy Klein. On and on and on until it's done. This is annoying if you have to do it manually. So you would write a function that does paging for you or the MG graph module does it for you and mini graph does the same. This is basically showing how it works, how you then use it is up to you. Again, in this case, I have a function that helps you do this. I'll show you the function as well. Okay, so the first bit is all similar to all the input, token, client ID, client secret. And the fun part comes here. So I make my own, I create a collection to store my results in. Because I'm going to get results every uh, step I get data back. But I want to have all the data. So I want to have all my 36 users. I don't just want to have the first 10 or whatever I'm querying. I'm invoking web request. No, I'm adding the data. But if it finds next link, just keep going. Just put the results in there and do this again and again and again until I no longer have um, a URI in there. Because if it doesn't have next, or if next link is empty, that means you've reached the end of the line. So, what I'll do this time is uh, query the same thing. Oh, use the proper token again. And now, this time I have all my users in one, even though my endpoint was limited to 10, it'll go, I'll fix it for you. If you do invoke web request and rest method, it will just limit to 10, and you have to do that manually. Like I said, modules commonly have this built in. Now the next bit is throttling. And I wanted to do a demo on the pester testing for it because it's, it's hard to generate once one second it's hard to generate a, a 429 error message for throttling but I'll show you the code how I've implemented I'll first go to your question question. The question is, um, would it be easier to, or better to first query the amount of users you have and then um, uh, adjust your filter accordingly? Or would it be better to just do it like this? I think personally the best is to do max results 1000, get as little as queries possible. Because like I said, if I put it at 1000 and I have 50 users, I get 50 users. So that doesn't matter. You want to limit the amount of queries you do. Does that answer the question? Cool. Like I said, throttling produces a 429 error code. And it's actually an error. It pushes you away. And it's basically Microsoft saying that, I'm too busy now. There's a queue, whatever. Or you've done too many requests. Get in line and come back later. Now, what? it does is, and I've added a document explaining the limits, the official limits provided by Microsoft. But there's also documentation on what the request, or what it looks like. Now, if you query and you get a 429, um, you get the, oh, too many requests, and it says, please retry after. and. This is when you can retry. So um, if you do it at nine seconds, tough luck. The only thing you're going to get is you're going to get, it's, it's like getting in a store. Eventually, they're going to push you back further 
and it's going to delay and throttle you even more. So the best thing to do is retry after that period, or what I do is that period plus one second. So like I said, the documentation is in there. It shows all the how-tos. I'll show you how I've done that in my code. And basically, at the end of each query, I save the status code so I can find it back. That's why I use invoke web requests, so I always get the status code. I will share the code, by the way, so you don't need to screenshot it or make a photo. Um, so I save it, and like I said, the 429 is a throw, so it you get the error. If I get a throw, so it's a try catch block, and I check if I get thrown because of 429, I look for the retry after period. And if it's there, I'll do, I'm retrying after that period plus one. So I'll sleep and I'll keep doing it again. I'll do that as long as I get 429. If I get something else, follow the rest of the logic. I hope that makes sense. It's unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, a little hard to demo because you can't decide on when, when you get throttled. Most of the time, it will be for your entire tenant that you get throttled. So it might not just be you doing a lot of queries, it might be colleagues. Last but not least, I'm going to show you a bit about batching. That's hopefully going to help you with things like throttling. Instead of doing a single query, and I, I want to do a query about users, and I want to link them to groups, and I want to get devices, things like that, you can do, just do a single query which has the Microsoft endpoint get all that information in a batch for you. It's called batching. Now, this is the whole setting up the token thing again. What you get is a different endpoint. It's the batch endpoint. Fairly simple. And the rest is all the same. However, you do a post. But what are you going to post? What's the body you're going to provide it? And if uh, I don't know if it's in my example here. No, that doesn't do. You commonly see Microsoft do this as well. If you, if you start looking at, uh, I'll quickly show, see if I can give an example. Um, if I. Oh, no, I'm going to have to click it first. Oh, forgot this. It's, let me redo that quickly, clear it. There we go. Exactly what I wanted. You see that Microsoft does batches because they don't want don't to exhaust their uh, backend either. And they just state what they want you to get. So if you want to create this, you have to figure out what do I want to query. In my example, I'm querying users and groups. Just give me all. But they're different queries. Normally, I'd have to use two. This time, I'm using one. So I'm creating a batch request. And I'm adding this to my body. And to show you, oh, uh, oh. it to JSON, simply saying, this is what, what I want you to get. However, this time, I just do one request, and 
I'm going to show you the example for the first value of each and every one. And I'll show you the ID of the job. So the ID number one should be querying users. ID number two should be querying groups. Oh, ah, wait, sorry. Move it up a little bit. ID number one, first user. ID number two, groups. This way you can optimize your queries, get throttled less, get more information quicker, find relations. Get that sorted. And with that, I think uh, coming back to the slides, it's going to be. Uh, is it showing up? Nope, it's not working. No. Oh, that really doesn't like it now. Basically, that was my presentation. So I was wondering if you have any questions about this. Yes? To, uh, I don't know if I understand the question correct. Could you repeat it? Okay, so the question is, if I hit the limit so I get throttled, is it possible to buy more? No. <laughs> it's as simple as that because, like I said, it might be you or your company uh, uh, querying your tenant too much, but it might also be the back end being too busy. In the documentation, it says this and this is possible causes. You just have to accept it. Uh, having said that, if you do batching, if one of the items gets throttled, um, you can't redo the batch until the highest retry after period has expired. So if I get throttled for 10 seconds on my users and 20 seconds on my groups, I can't retry the batch after 20. So that's an important thing to know. Anybody else? No? Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I was going to say I was going to repeat the question, but I didn't hear an actual question. But the thing you said was you also have managed identities, which you can also use instead of certificates, and you can add permissions to it. However, if you check with Ben, he said it's not documented because you can do it, but I'm not quite sure if that's the official supported way. So for now, I'm using this as it's the official supported way. If you can do it, maybe they'll change it in the long run. But for now, I'm sticking with this for production. You brought it up, not me. Yes. Okay, so the question if I'm not, uh, not mistaken is, um, what's the limitation of not using managed identities over certificates? Um, like I said, uh, as far as, I didn't look into managed identities myself, uh, but judging on what Ben said, and I know he looked into it, is it's not officially documented, supported. It might work, like, like I said in my first presentation. Officially, the beta endpoints are not used for production. However, if you look at 95%, if you look at 95% of the queries Microsoft does, it's on the beta endpoint. So it might work. However, no guarantee. So production level, I, I wouldn't touch it. You, you can play with it. Maybe it's going to change in, in the future. Yeah, so the remark is, if you could use managed identities, you could use it to access the key vault and retrieve the updated certificate. However, 
why would you access the key vault to get the certificate if you're using managed identities? So that it, it, it's either or. You don't if you're using certificates. That's uh, then you would use a managed identity to um, update the certificate, but not do anything else. You can do that. So for now, if there's any other questions, just come visit me. But the time's up, and I want to have uh, a stage free for the next speaker. Thank you.